Hello, everyone. May I have your attention? Shh. Welcome again. I knew we need. I know we need a few seconds to get you back. Okay. There is space in the front. Just walk in. We are not shy here, no problem. So we are going to start the typical what's new session where we present the tool. This week is all about sharing experiences, projects, challenges, good results. But this session is about the tool itself, what is new. In the last version, we are very uh, proud to present the work of one year a big team of developers, big team of implementers, product that is the work of a lot of people being represented here. I am Marta Vila. I, I, I didn't introduce myself. Um, and I'm not going to be talking much today. But uh, I have the honor to present the six people that are going to be presenting this work. We will start with Marcus, which is going to give us an intro uh, for the annual release that we are presenting. Then we will have David to talk about maintenance and aggregated data entry. We will have Mike for capture events and tracker with very big news on the capture app. Where is Mike? Here. Then we will have Nancy to present us the Android capture app with also some improvements on analysis. Scott to always show us the most beautiful part of the HIS2 with analytics. And then Austin, we will talk about extensibility, very important as Christine was introducing before for extending the HIS2. So I think that's all from me. I hope you enjoy uh, this, this session and this new version of the HIS2. Over to Marcus. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. <clears throat> yes. Last year, as you will remember from the what's next, looking back and looking forward session, um, we have um, made a release that um, we codenamed Samwise internally. We um, are focusing on quality, design, and extensibility. Um, we have, um, um, uh, we, we have uh, um, some, um, uh, uh, some, um, uh, Extra, we, have, we, have a, sorry, we have an extra session on extensibility at the very end. Um, we um, uh, also have extensibility in our DNA, and we are thinking about extensibility always in our APIs and in our communities and um, in the way we work. Um, we will see how design and quality has um, made its way into the features that the product managers are going to show us. Um, in a short while, uh, when they uh, demo the, the nice new things that um, we are releasing in 2.41. Um, but first and foremost, we want 2.41 to be a release to depend on for a while. Uh, we want this um, uh, to be a release that you guys will remember and many of you will upgrade to and stay on for a while. One of the reasons for this is that we did slow down the release, uh, major release cadence a bit this time. We had a one-year release. Um, this was um, partially realizing that um, um, it is uh, not easy to stay on top of the latest release. When you, uh, when you have a new release every six months, there is not that many of you that will upgrade every six months anyway. Um, but um, we also want to emphasize, this is the slide from last year's What's Next, and, and it very well il illustrates the reality we had ended up with. Um, we want to emphasize how we are um, releasing much more than once a year. We are actually releasing the patch releases um, every six weeks, approximately. And then on top of that, we have um, tens, if not hundreds, of releases of the apps where we are pushing out new functionality. We are giving you guys um, um, updates that, uh, that um, 
will allow you to, um, to, to get the latest features you need or try them. Even if you don't upgrade the core version, you might be able to run um, an uh, app upgrade and um, see the, the changes that you're waiting for much quicker than we ever were able to, to provide. Um, in fact, on the, um, on the release notes this year for 41, there will be a lot of, um, of features released that um, uh, is backward compatible. So you can use them even if you're back on 238, for example. Um, as we give you a new release, the things you see might be, uh, oops, uh, might be something that looks a little bit like this. Um, you will see the screenshots, you will see the features, and we will soon get to see the product managers demo some of the features. Um, but in this release, we have also allowed ourselves to do um, much more um, that is not that visible, that is not that easy to put on the web page and, and show, show you guys. So I want to dive a little bit into that. DHS2 has been around for a very long time, and um, making sure that we can um, don't uh, paint ourselves into a corner or build something that's not maintainable and usable is um, more and more important. We intend to stay around for a long time longer. And um, uh, under the Samwise umbrella, we have been able to um, give the engineering teams a little bit more freedom to build and fix and clean up some things that we hope will help uh, a lot down the line. So let's take a look behind the facade of the screenshot here. And that's, uh, this is how it looks, or can look. Um, <coughs> we, 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 have, um, uh, we have been doing a lot of internal things with our, co with our code, and it wouldn't be very fun with the screenshot of code up here. So, so I had to settle for some, something that uh, ChatGPT made for me. Uh, but we are uh, putting more focus on making sure that our code is structured in the right way, that it's readable, and that it is um, maintainable. And this um, is um, something that you may, may not see on the release. And when you upgrade to 241, you will not notice that there is actually a change in how the rule engine works. We, just, we have just one code base now, and, then, uh, and um, all of the rules are being run in the same way. Um, but um, we hope that down the line it will be a very good uh, value when the bugs that's in the category of my rule doesn't work uh, the same on Android and web um, is uh, reduced or completely eliminated, hopefully. Yeah. Um, yeah. We also focus on readability. And another reason for that is that we want it to be easier to contribute, to make external contributions. And um, if the code is not readable, then it's very easy to make a mistake, even if you're in on the core team. Um, but it's um, even harder to contribute if you're not um, one of the developers sitting inside the core team. So this is an important step for, for enabling external contributions as well. Um, one of the other things that we have done much more of in the, in the Samwise release is to fix bugs. That sounds kind of, kind of boring, I know. But um, looking at this graph, we are very proud of this one. Uh, you can see in the beginning of the year, we, we started out um, fixing around uh, approximately the same amount of bugs that we created. Uh, but during the year, we have uh, been catching up. Yeah. <laughs> I should say found, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> as you can see, the as the graph goes down, we we have been um, been um, fixing and closing bugs faster and faster. Um, at the uh, yeah, the, uh, of course, you might say, okay, you you are guessing less bugs in and and. Um, uh, that's not true. We are not getting less bugs in. We are getting actually more bugs in in some ways. We are doing new initiatives called bug bashes, where we invite a uh, bigger organization to go and find bugs in the, in the code. We have the, the beta testing program, and we have um, uh, increased test capacity. So we are actually finding more bugs, but we are fixing and closing even more bugs. So um, the, that, that's why the graph is going down like this. 
And it allows us to respond faster. So hopefully now you will see that when you register a bug, you'll, you, it'll, it won't stay in the open state for very long. There will be someone that takes a look and pass it on to the development teams uh, or close it. And um, it's easier for us to stay on top of the, the backlog. So we really hope that this is going to be a lasting um, effect of this, uh, this year, uh, latest release. Uh, small plug, there is a session on on the quality efforts um, titled Feedback Jira and Quality at 1440. That's one of the parallel sessions. You should really go there and, and uh, listen to Lina, the new QA um, lead, um, and, uh, and see what uh, the magic is in the source here. So, small plug. Um, one last shout out before I go and leave the stage to David and let him show us some features on aggregate and uh, maintenance. Uh, we had a beta testing program, and I want to say thank you to everyone who participated. This is invaluable uh, to us. We can't um, foresee absolutely everything that you, um, you guys uh, come up with in the field. The real innovation happen happens in your country. You, you are um, setting up so many creative use cases and using DHS in so many ways, and we really want to make sure that uh, although the core is stable, please help us, please help us test with your uh, metadata. This is the only test when it, when it comes to the field. And um, with the good efforts in 241, we hope that this is one of the most stable releases ever. We. Um, also want to say that next year, please come back and everyone who signed up this year and couldn't quite make it, please, re please consider doing so next year as well. We really need you guys. All right, that was it for me. And uh, then we have David. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is David Kennedy. I'm the Configuration and Aggregate Data Entry um, Product Manager. Uh, I know that configuration is not the most exciting topic that you'll hear about today, but it is important. And it's very important also to keep um, people's instances neat and tidy. So I will run through this really quickly, and then we can get to the more fun stuff. I'd like to start where everyone starts in DHS2. We've got a brand new login app um, released with 41. As you can see, the, the original screen looks not too different. It's quite, quite familiar. But we also know that a lot of you like to customize your login apps. So we've made that a bit easier. And we've introduced the concept of themes. So with a simple click, you can change the layout of your login app. And very soon, we'll be coming um, more features so that you can upload pictures, change colors, change font sizes, all of this directly in the system settings without having to do full customizations. And I can just quickly jump across and show you. So if this mouse isn't working, sorry about that. And that doesn't look like it's going to write. So if this is the login app. And we were to come to the system settings. In the appearance where all of the other login app um, settings are, are there, there's now an option to just cut and paste and add your own custom HTML code. So if I switch that over, come back to the login app and refresh, you see you can change all of the colors and the layout as much as you want. And even though you could do this before, now it's as simple as cutting and pasting HTML into the settings app and your creativity is your only limit. <laughs> I'll switch that back. <laughs> All right. Okay, come back to the presentation. And next I'd like to introduce a couple of new features that will be repeated over the, the different products. So these are things that are introduced in 41 but um, touch a lot of the different product groups. So we now have multi-select option sets for individual data um, and custom icons. So I'm just going to have a little, I'll just show you a couple of screenshots of how they are implemented in the maintenance app. 
So we now have a new value type for option set. So you can see here the text with multiple values um, as opposed to just text. So you, in this example, you can see you can get rid of having a slash option, um, nurse slash midwife, because you can also just select midwife and nurse um, as both relevant where used. And just quickly, you can see in the maintenance app, if you add that option set to a um, data element, the value type will change as well to multiple values. And we'll see how that flows through the system and comes into the um, data collection and also the analytics as the presentations go on. Similar with custom icons, we now have the option in maintenance to load, manage, and update custom icons. And we'll see how they pop up later on in the presentations. Still on the maintenance app and option sets, we've added this new feature to search through options um, in the maintenance app. So when you have a lot of options, there's pages and pages. We've heard frequently that this is difficult to manage. So now you can go into the maintenance app, search through, and locate what you're looking for much, much quicker. All right, moving on to data integrity. Again, very, very important and sometimes overlooked part of it is, is managing metadata in big instances that can get a little bit unwieldy over time. Um, we've done a complete overhaul of the metadata integrity UI. So when you run all of these checks that tell you information about um, what might be errors in your metadata, um, this now lets you run each test individually. So you can test and rerun and rerun rather than running all of them all at once. And you can also click through um, you get much more detailed information and recommendations about each of these errors, so you get direct feedback. And one of the best things I like about this is you then get a click through on the errors to go directly into the maintenance app where that error is there. So you can go in and find out more information, correct it if you can, uh, and then come back to these data integrity checks. So again, it's just another way that we're giving people um, new tools to make sure that the metadata stays neat and up to date. Another sometimes um, painful for some but maybe overlooked for a lot of people is, is scheduling jobs. Um, we now have introduced queues to the, to the scheduler UI app. So if you've ever had to run an analytics table app and wait for it to finish before running something else or try to guess the time and schedule it when it will have finished, um, you don't have to do that anymore. You can go in and create a queue. So you can wait for, set one job to finish first before the next job Will, will kick off. So this takes the guesswork out of it or the waiting times for running those, lo those long jobs. All right, and then this is a big one. I'm very, very, very happy to introduce the new, whole new maintenance app in 41. So we're releasing in 41 as a preview um, and the elements that you see highlighted in red here are the ones that are, that are available now, the data elements, uh, but it is on continuous release and um, so we'll be bringing out more modules over this year before 42, so keep your eye out. But as Marcus introduced at the start, this is really about going back to the code, making sure the foundation is strong so that we can update this app a lot more quickly, we can be more responsive to changes, and um, make sure that the, the whole app supports everybody's needs more quickly. So, you can see the, the data entry forms um, that the, for creating data elements is all, all refreshed. There's a lot more information, there's a lot neater, there's more options for present, presenting it, a lot more modernized. But it's not just a like-for-like like, um, replacement. We have also added some, some often requested and, and good new features. Um, so you can filter your data elements by data set now as an option for filtering. And you can also update um, sharing in bulk. So you can filter by data set, filter, make, create your filters, select all of the data elements and update the sharing at once. So I'll just open up the maintenance app and we can have a look at that. It's quite simple. Filter by a data set, select all, update the sharing. Select the group you want to update it to, and their access level, add to actions, and update. So again, if you've got a lot of, <laughs> thank you, I know this has been a pain point for a lot of people. So if you've got a lot of, lot of elements that you need to change at once, that's a few clicks rather than a lot of repetitive clicking in and out. 
So hopefully that helps. But like I said, this app's on, the maintenance app is on continuous release, so keep an eye out for more updates. We'll really see more modules, and we'll keep you updated when we, we get that up. Um, it is available from the App Store, so when you install 41, you go to the App Store and download the new maintenance app. We've also been updating the ag aggregate data entry form. So we know this is another area that people do a lot of customizations in their aggregate um, data entry forms. So we're bringing some of the configurations into the settings so that you don't have to go to a full custom app if you want to make some minor changes, making it a lot faster and a lot easier to tailor your data collection for your context and for your, your elements without having to create an entirely new app or entirely new forms. So there's now in each section form, there's now an option to pivot the category rows and data elements if you'd like. So we've got an example here that might be a bit small to look, but I can, I can pull it up. Um, so if you select for a certain section that you want to pivot the data elements and categories, it will switch which ones are in the um, columns, which ones are in the rows. So sometimes if you have a lot of choices, it can um, be really powerful to change the orientation of this to make it easier for the data collectors. And I know a lot of people do this custom, but now you can do it straight out of the configuration. Um, and the other thing we've added, which again is, is something that people do a lot for custom forms, is just the ability to, to add text before or after sections. So if you want to add some instructions um, or some explanation, you can just now go into the section editing form and, um, and just add the text directly. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll, I'll, that demo takes a little while, so I'll, I'll move over that. And I want to finish on um, the aggregate data exchange configuration UI. This has been available for a while. So the aggregate data exchange app allows you to transfer data between DHS2 instances but also to transform data from um, tracker to aggregate. So if you set up a program indicators that you'd like to um, transfer, transform that data into uh, aggregate data elements, the aggregate data exchange app allows you to do that. And now you can configure those exchanges directly within the app. Um, so you can create a whole bunch of requests, map which elements you'd like to transfer from or transform to. Um, it's a lot more powerful this app is also on continuous release. We will continually release um, upgrades to the UI to make it a bit easier to use. Uh, and I won't go into a demo of this because they've been involved, but the Global Fund are presenting their experience. They've been using it extensively in the field. Um, on Wednesday at 11.15, so someone's excited about that, that's great. I do recommend if you want to know more about the aggregate data exchange and how it works to catch that session. All right, and it's over to Mike for individual data. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Um, just he, he was a little more humble than I think needed to be. I think that those of you that configure programs right now should be really excited. The new maintenance app is going to save you, I think, hundreds of hours of work. Uh, so we'll be real excited to see the new additions to that. So I'm the product manager for Tracker. Um, really, at this point, it's all individual data, Tracker and events. They've both been combined into the Capture app, and that is our big announcement for 41, is at this point, the Capture app now can do everything that the old Tracker Capture app did, plus more. And we really want to, yes. We're very excited about that. We're excited about that for a number of reasons. I mean, of course, there's the very boring maintainability side of it, but actually what it gives you all is the ability to have this app on continuous release. It's really important with individual data to stay on top of upgrades because that's also where you get uh, security fixes. That's where you're going to get new functionality, many highly requested things. And the Capture app being on continuous release allows us to continue to add that kind of functionality throughout the year and allow you to take advantage of it more quickly. Uh, we also did a lot of work behind the scenes uh, to harmonize the API to make it make a lot more sense. Uh, so there are quite a few changes to that that you really want to be familiar with if you're using the API for your apps or for some of your processes. Uh, we've got updated uh, guidance and documentation around this. I'm going to walk you through some of the things that are in the Capture app that aren't in the old Tracker Capture that are, will hopefully motivate you to, to make the switch but did want to point out very importantly that the, the tracker old API endpoint is being retired. 
So it's bundled now in 41, but won't be in the next big release. So it really is a year of trying to make the switch, uh, switching over the, the way that you're using the API and taking advantage of those endpoints. Um, we're always very happy to be in close contact with you as you're going through this and you're finding anything that you have a challenge, we, we can provide some support and guidance. So again, I won't go into all of this text, but just want to say there's kind of some big areas within the Capture app that are significant new functionality that may motivate you to take advantage of the Capture app. Um, for example, the working list will take a, a look at scheduling so that now you can have your own uh, cadence of when you recommend the next scheduled event to be take place, giving you a lot more control over the layout and the look and also the ability to build your own widgets that can be embedded directly into the Capture app so that it gives you a lot more freedom to not have to create an entirely new app. You can rather create a widget that is embedded into the, this app and more uh, ability to look into the change log, see who has been manipulating what record and what changes were made, et cetera. So let's take a look at some of these. Um, yeah, just wanted to really make it sure that you're aware. It's on continuous release. Um, so you'll see from the dates here, I mean, we have just constant updates that are rolling out. Uh, many of them are not going to be any kind of significant or breaking change for you. They're going to be small updates. We are going to be having more information available with the release, the continuous release, so that you know what is actually in there and what you're going to get out of it, especially because we know that training users is really the most significant expense and challenge for upgrades. We, we want to make sure that the, the changes that we introduce aren't something that are going to really confuse anybody. Um, but it's also important to say that this app is back supported to 238, meaning that almost all of the functionality that you'll see is something that can still work even if you don't upgrade to 241. You can upgrade your capture app. So it's something that we really hope gives you the motivation to make the switch over. So one of the things, again, that we've been talking a lot about is extensibility. You'll hear a bit more from Austin later in the session to talk about this, but wanted to show you kind of the simplicity of how this works. Uh, the, we have these plugin uh, points within the Capture app that allow you to, to make plugins, widgets, and embed them directly into the enrollment dashboard, into the data entry form. Uh, we have the, the documentation to show you how to do this, but I was going to show you one example of this that is also ended up being a cool feature. So we'll take a quick look at wherever this is. Well, all right, I'm never good with the hotkeys. I think, yep, yeah, this is a good place to be. Okay, so if you take a look in the App Hub, we, we actually use the new extension points ourselves to create something that people have requested for quite a while, which is the capture growth chart. Uh, based on the WHO Z scores for weight, height, uh, that can be embedded in your application when you have a program that it makes sense for, if you're doing growth monitoring, if you're doing nutrition, et cetera. And the configuration of this is very easy. You install it, and then in the data store management, you'll just be able to create a config file for it that tells it exactly where you want it to be, what you want it to look like. You can put it into the enrollment and you'll see that it's, it's very tiny. It's, it's just being able to plug in a plugin, right? So it actually is, is very simple to do and creating the plugins themselves is also much easier than creating a new application. So we really want to encourage new innovation in this area, and the Capture app has multiple points that you'll be able to take advantage of this. So just to give you a, a look at what this is like, I'm going to go into the Capture app, and we'll take a look at the immunization registry program. Uh, so if I go into an individual here, so we have embedded the growth chart here in the enrollment dashboard. So you can see all of the events that are a part of the immunization registry, where they are capturing some birth details, they're providing the immunizations over time, and they're doing some growth monitoring. And then it will be displayed here in the chart. You can switch between the charts based on the sex. You have the length, height for age, the weight for age, and these are all the parameters that are based on the, the WHO Z scores. 
Those can also be changed if your country has its own growth values that it wants to see mapped. Those are things that can be changed in that same application. You don't need to make your new widget. You can just do it based on the guidance that we have provided, which is fairly straightforward. And now that we're here, I wanted to show you a couple of other things uh, that are, are uh, new and in big improvements. So, for example, we've uh, decoupled the idea of transfer and referral. I know that you're probably very used to the, the kind of one-time transfer or permanent transfer dialogue. That doesn't really match the way that it's being used in the field and can end up being a bit confusing for both the user and also when it comes to analytics, figuring out where something occurred. So we have now just a, a dialogue for transfer completely. Uh, this is what is replacing that permanent transfer from before. Very straightforward that you would be able to say, for example, this patient, we want to move them uh, from the facility where we are to a different facility. You do the transfer and one significant change you'll see is that now the ownership has changed right here in the enrollment widget. And that ownership is now an analyzable value as well. So now you can start to break things out based on where something was initially started in the enrollment. You can see exactly where an event was performed, but you also have this concept of ownership to give proper attribution based on what kind of analytics that you want to run. So, yes, that's a good one. All right, we can, we can see now how the referral works. It's a bit different. So what we've done is made a relationship that's a stage to stage relationship. I can show you what that looks like, but I wanted to show you just really quickly how it appears for the user. So I'm just gonna say I've, I've done a birth uh, notification here. I'm gonna complete, oh, we have an error. Never mind. I'm gonna show you that in a slide. I promise it works. <laughs> I've surely just signed in with the wrong user or something. Yeah, here we go. This is what you would see if I didn't do it wrong. Um, this is the transfer, then the referral. You'd get this widget just at the bottom of that because you've related these stages. It knows that one of the things you might want to do is this action as a referral. And so you would just click on the schedule, it's going to pull it up, you can pick what the date is, uh, and you can decide where it's going to go. And that's replacing the old one-time transfer from Tracker Capture. And it's going to schedule an event in that other site, and is going to have the information for them of the referral reason, uh, why it's being sent, and then they have the option to interact with that referral and say, this person never arrived, they didn't show up, or to decline it, say, we don't offer those services, we've referred it to another location. So there's a lot more behind the scenes of how these referrals are going to work. All right, I'm going to go back and see if I can not screw up the next thing. So, for example, I'm going to back out of uh, this person. Let's say we have a, a relationship. Okay, this is an off requested feature. We now have inheritable attributes, and what that means for you is that the attributes that you have already entered for this tracked entity, their first name, their last name, their location, their phone number, all of these things can be marked as inheritable so that when you go to do something like, for example, you're going to add them, you're, you suspect this child in the immunization program has an adverse event, so you want to be able to create this relationship and you'll pull it up and automatically it will pre-populate because of these attributes are inheritable. So you save a lot of time with your data entry. You don't have to do this twice and it carries over when you create that new uh, relationship or the new tracked entity. Um, you'll see here just briefly the custom icons are appearing. So this is uh, not one of the standard DHS2 icons, but a custom icon. And I'm going to back out of this now, and I'm going to show you a bit of the working list. Okay, the working list here are really meant to be for the person that is actively doing data entry or data capture. They're the ones that are actively seeing clients and are working with this. This is meant to support their workflows. So you know that there's already uh, some pre-configured ways to look at their list if they want to see their scheduled appointments uh, for today, etc. 
but we've made it much easier to create and share your own views. So for example, I'm gonna do a working list that's based on a specific stage. I'm gonna say in the immunization stage, and what I'd like to see is all of the children that are not registered in the national CRVS system, which is one of the questions that was in that stage. And I'm just gonna create my own working list update it and I'll get the full list of those that were either not registered or it's unknown if they're registered. And I can just save this view and share it. So CRVS needed. Okay, it is now available as a working list for me going forward. I don't need to keep recreating this as this becomes part of my workflow. And I also have the option to share that with different users or different user groups. So it should make it really easy for them to be able to fine tune the kind of list that they work from if they're doing outreach or something. Um, it allows you also to pull up anything that's been assigned to you as a user. So you can quickly be able to see, I'm gonna clear out some of these because nothing from immunization was there, but I am assigned this user uh, or this tracked entity as follow-up um, and it allows me to, to make the most of, of the, the actions I actually need to take as a user of the system. Uh, I also have the ability to download that data. And so this is, for example, many times they're doing outreach, they want to be able to create a list of those children that they would want to follow up with. They know that while they're doing outreach, they're not going to have connectivity. They also perhaps aren't using Android, so they don't have offline, but they could still download it as a CSV file. They can open it up in Excel and still have their list available to them. All right, can I go to just another couple of things and then we'll wrap it up. Oh yeah, just wanted to show you quickly what the new change log looks like. Uh, so on any anything in the, the data entry area is going to be tagged by user, by date, and will give you the exact change that occurred. It's a much cleaner, nicer interface. It's a, a lot easier for, the, for someone to navigate. And I think with that, maybe I'll wrap it up in the interest of time. So, Please update to the Capture app. We do have a session later in the week that is focused on transitioning from Tracker Capture to Capture, also to the new data entry app, also looking at the new maintenance app. So there, there are a number of things that you will learn in, about how to, to make the kind of switch for your instance. Um, and we also will have a couple of sessions that are focused on the use of the Capture app and large scale kind of use of doing any individual level tracking. So, Please join us for those sessions, and with that, I will turn it over to Nancy, who's going to talk to us about Android. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? My name is Nancy Espinosa. I'm part of the DHIS2 Android Capture App team. And I'm very pleased to be presenting you this morning the features in 2.9 and 3.0. As some of you may know, we have two major releases in a year, so I'm going to wrap it up in just one presentation. Our main focus is on user experience, but we also have some other new features like line list for analytics and the export database for troubleshooting, remote troubleshooting. So as I was saying, we call it 3.0 because we have a lot of new, um, new features around user experience and we try to tackle it uh, from two different paths. The first one is a faster data entry, allowing the user to click less to get uh, to enter the, the data uh, faster. And the second path is the learnability, which basically we're trying to make the app more intuitive so the user take less time in learning on how to use it. If you want to learn more about this topic, we have a session tomorrow at 10.30 uh, that is called Designing Software and Implementations with Users in Mind. So for the first part, which is the user experience, I'm going to be dividing it in three sections. The first one is simplify steps and reduce options. The second one is intuitive user experience. And the third one is more customization. So we have uh, when a configuration only has one program, the user after the first 
uh, sync, the first login, the user will land directly into the patient's dashboard or the TI dashboard instead of uh, going to the um, program list, to the home. We also have now the working list more visible. We used to have them in this uh, filters icon here. You needed to tap it and then select the working list. Now it's visible for everyone to see it when the program opens. The user is now available, also available to, to disable the referrals. You need to do that using the Android settings web app. In the program specific settings, you can tap, check the disabled TI referrals and it won't appear on the list. Uh, this is not new, but you can also hide the, the schedule new button by checking the hide due date in the program configuration in the maintenance app. We also have a new forms layout, which what we are trying to do is to get the user um, uh, quicker in the data entry. Before, we used to have two different screens, the event details, which is the metadata configuration, the report day, organization unit, uh, category combination if configured. But now, we have it all in one screen, uh, which is the first uh, section will be the details of that event, and then we'll have the data elements or the rest of the fields. And related to that, we have also the possibility to flatten the sections. What I mean by that, when you have an event that has multiple sections, we used to have it collapse with the next button. Uh, and when you click that next button, then it will open the, the next section. But in this case, if you don't want that, if you want the user to be faster, then you can remove that and the user can scroll up and down to see the different values. So I'm going to show you that in my phone. As you can see, uh, when I open the app, the first screen I see is the, the patient's list. Sorry, I said before dashboard, but it's the patient's list. Or uh, the search screen, in case you don't have configured um, the patient's list screen. And the first thing I see are the, um, the working list, and I can scroll just to see all the um, available. I cannot see Mike's because he didn't share it with us. But. If he has, then I will be able to see that. Then, when I open any patient or any TI, um, I land into the TI's uh, dashboard. If I tap on the plus icon, you can see that I, on I only have two different options, the schedule new and the add new. I don't have the referrals because I previously disabled it in the, using the Android settings web app. If I open the form, I can open the event or I, or I can open the registration. So if I open it, I will see the first section uh, is uh, the one with the details. And then if I scroll down, you see I flatten also the section so I don't have the next button. I just scroll down and I can see the rest of the fields. Okay, for the second part, we have the intuitive user experience. So we now supported the TI header. What is a TI header? Is basically just a title that we give uh, to a TI, to a patient, to a person, uh, whatever we are tracking. And it's a program indicator that you can configure using different attributes in the program with fixed text or whatever label you need to create that a specific um, title. So it will be easier for the user to find the TI that, that, that they are looking for. We also have redesigned the cards. And we tried to move from the multiple icons to have more text in a colorful way. We, ha we also have icons, but we tried to emphasize it with, with, word, with word, sorry. And we have some examples there in the screen, like mark for follow-up or event completed, the view only, which is information for the user to make an action or just to know what is going on with the TI. We also have a new search uh, layout. We used to have it, I think we have, yeah, we have the screen here. We have here the 2.8. Uh, as you can see, the button only says search. Now we have a search for the particular TI that we are uh, tracking. Then if configured, then you will have the add new person there. Here's also another uh, comparison. You'll see that we have this optional label there. And we have it because it used to get a bit confusing to have those uh, fields, it looked like a form. So now we have it as optional because the user don't need to uh, add them all to start a search. Um, another cool feature is that if you have a unique 
ID uh, as a barcode or as a QR that is also searchable. When you have only one match, the app will open directly uh, to the TI dashboard. Uh, let me show you that with my phone real quick. So if I go back and then search for person, unique system identifier, and I just scan this, then I will go directly to the patient's dashboard. Um, okay, there also, uh, there is also a new redesign of the TI dashboard. The bottom of, uh, of the screen is show you the, the details of the, of the person. As you can see, oh, you cannot see, let me show you. As you can see there in my phone, uh, there is the primary contact number, which is a tappable area. So if you tap on that, it will open uh, your phone with the number specifically if you want to call. But there are also some other, you can see, uh, there are bigger icons. Uh, the font also is bigger, so it's easier and it's more intuitive to use. And in that path, we also have changed and redesigned the value types, the different value types. So as you can see as well, it's, it's really easier to, to know what to do in each field. Here's a comparison between 2.8 and 3.0. And then in the last part of the user experience, we have the more customization. Uh, I think uh, David and Mike already talked a bit about it. Uh, we have some custom icons that you can use in program stages, programs, and also in options in a data element. We have customized tracker terminology, and in this version at least, we have two different terms uh, that you can customize. There are enrollment and the event, but in a context of a program stage, I will show you that. How, how it looks in the, in the app. And we also have the custom base map layer. This is not new uh, for the web, but it's new for Android. You can now use the custom base map that, that you had already configured in the maintenance app. So, I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to create a new person. Okay, so, as I was saying, the first part is the details one, so I can change the date, but by default is the current date, but you can change it. Then I'm going to create a new person. Like the like the singer, okay, I'm saving it. Oh, sorry. Okay, as you can see, uh, because of the configuration of the program, um, I have uh, to schedule events, uh, but what I want you to see is actually this part right here, where you can see the customizations. Instead of saying enter a event, which what it will say, it says enter birth registration or enter immunization visit because I already assigned a specific name per stage and so it's shown like this and also if I open the edit person here, it says registration instead of enrollment. So you can change that. Um, you can see also, I already show you, but you can see also uh, the, the, how the new form looks with the new value types. It's bigger, descriptions are there as well. Okay, let me go back to the presentation. And last but not least, we have three main features, uh, multi-select value types, import-export database, and line listing analytics. The multi-select, uh, which was already explained, but basically allows you to select more than one option. So it has two renderizations in the app. The first one is if you have less than seven options, so you will be able to see something like this, and you will be able to select as it looks like this. But if you have more than seven options, 
um, you will open a new dialog and you can search the particular option that you're looking for and you can select it and then save it and it will save and see and render something like this. Also, now you can also uh, export a database, an encrypted database, and you can send it to an admin or the person who is helping you to do some troubleshooting in case you have an error or you cannot sync or whatever um, error you find in the app. And the admin can import it by using the uh, user credentials. And we also have the line listing. Uh, now you can add these line listing uh, tables. You need to configure them in the web and then add them using the Android Settings web app. And then you will be able to see them in home or programs, depending on, on where you configure it. So I'm going to show you that in my phone. Right now, I have it here in the analytics tab. So what you can do, you can change the size of the column if you want to. You can scroll to see the rest of the fields and you can search. So for example, I can search for the one person I already created, for example, John, and I tap on the search. And I even can add another uh, parameter here, for example, the first contact, which is Sam, and I'm search, and I can find the person that I'm looking for. There is some limitations. There is a maximum rows that you can have in the app, but it will tell you at the bottom of the table when you have reached that limit. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. I will leave you to Scott explaining analytics. So you couldn't tell, but that was Nancy's first time presenting What's New. So let's give her another round of applause. Oh, how do I close your app? Just like that? Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Scott Ruspatrick. I'm the analytics product manager and I'm gonna take us through what the analytics team has been working on for the last year. So we've been quite busy. I'm gonna start off very simple, not to overwhelm you too much with how awesome it's going to become. And that's gonna be with cumulative values and pivot tables. Now, it has been a very long request that we are able to add data over time directly in the pivot table without you having to make an indicator or a program indicator. Sounds relatively simple. It's a really important use case, especially for immunization, where you have totals, uh, number of children being uh, immunized every month, doses being distributed every month, and you want to compare those running totals against, say, your, your uh, annual targets. So let's just go over to that. I think I have to go to this one. Probably have to update real here, quick. All right, I'm gonna go into everyone's favorite data visualizer application. I'm gonna switch over to, oop, I need to zoom out a bit. Pivot table. I am going to search for doses. I'm then going to go to just my data elements, turn on all of these data elements that are all of my immunization doses, click update. So now you see that I have all my doses in the columns and in the rows I have each month. I'm going to switch my rows and columns. Update, so now you see I have each month number of doses for each immunization. Now to get cumulative values is very simple. I just go to options, data, cumulative values, and update. So now you see that the values are actually aggregating over time. If, if I'm getting a clap for that one, then what's up next is gonna be, <laughs> you, guys, you guys are gonna be on your feet. <laughs> but that one was a long time request, so we're, we're glad we finally got to it. Okay, the next one is we have a new visualization type in the data visualizer application. It's outlier tables. So, important to note, gone are the days where you had excuses for not finding outliers. Every DHIS2 instance, every database in the world has outliers. Data quality issues are a fact of life. Our responsibility is to be able to capture those and correct those. Uh, it is not a failure of the database to have data quality issues. It is, a, it is your failure to let the data quality issues persist. And we are trying to... <laughs> 
just to be blunt. You're going to have data quality issues. But we have to make sure that we have the tools and we have the know-how to be able to address those data quality issues as they come in and fix them. Again, most countries are being plagued by the persistence of outliers in the database. Outliers throw off your national uh, key impact indicators. And some, in many cases, they can really throw them off quite severely. So we wanted to make it extremely easy for you to capture these outliers, find them, let DHIS2 be smart enough to automatically detect them, and then you have a list of them that you can go in and, and, uh, and correct. I also just want to point out, this brings us up to feature parity with the WHO data quality app that's been around for quite a while. Um, uh, we have all of the visualization types that were presented in that application. Now in the data visualizer application, they can also be put onto the dashboard. So let's go back to our demo. All right, so I'm just gonna go to my uh, chart types. I'm gonna choose outlier table. I'm just gonna go ahead and leave these data elements turned on, click update, wait a few seconds, and here are all of my outliers. So you can see I have my data column. So I can see that this is for a uh, doses given. I can see if it has a category option combination disaggregation. I can see for which month, I can see for which health facility, I can see the value that was recorded, so 13,000, uh, yeah, 1,314. I can see the median that is usually captured, which is 13.5. So you can see why this is an outlier. 1,314 is way bigger than 13.5. And then you can also see my modified Z score, if you're into the math, uh, your absolute deviation, and your min and max. And you can see here that we're sorting by value. We can sort by any of these columns. If you wanted to see just the top 10 outliers for your data, you can go to options. You can go to um, uh, data tab. And you can say, um, right now I'm showing 20. I can show 10. And here are my top 10 outliers for these data elements. You can, of course, put this, you can save this, put this on a dashboard, and then you can start pushing it out, and you can make sure that everybody can find their outliers. Okay? Thank you. Okay. All right. The next functionality is tracked entity line lists. So we have, a new we have a new output type in the line listing app. It is for having a, a single row per tracked entity. And you are able to bring data from any program that that tracked entity is enrolled in into that row. Woo! Thank you. We really should have clapped more for the other products too. Okay, so let me just do a quick demonstration. I'm gonna go over to the line listing app. And immediately what you see is our output types. We used to have only two, event and enrollment. Now we also have tracked entity. So I'm gonna turn on tracked entity. And then I'm gonna choose my tracked entity that I want to see my outputs for. I'm gonna go ahead and go down to person. And then the keen eye would have seen that as I selected person, my left side dimension panel has also updated with attributes and data selection, data dimensions that are specific to the person tracked entity type. So I'm gonna go by person dimensions. I'm gonna turn on just a couple of person dimensions and what we're seeing here are all of the attributes that are associated with the person tracked entity. I'm gonna turn on last name and first name. And then I'm gonna go into my program dimensions and you see all of the programs that a uh, person can be enrolled in. Okay, so I'm gonna go, I have just a couple of demo programs here. So I'm gonna go into program one and I'm gonna turn on just a few data elements. I'm also gonna go ahead and turn on the enrollment date. You can see how, it is, how easy it is to turn on data items. Then I'm gonna go into program two. A very, again, a completely different program, different data. I'm gonna turn on a couple of data elements and then my enrollment data as well. All right, and so now you see I have a line list each row represents an individual person, and you can see the data from program one here, as well as any data that exists for program two, okay? 
So a big question is, well, what if I want to see those individuals that have data captured in one program but not another one? For example, with, uh, many countries are using DHIS2 for civil and birth registration, also for immunization programs. You have a child that is born, they are enrolled in, and data is captured for the birth registration program. Then you want to make sure that same child is also enrolled in the immunization program. Okay, so how do I see children that are in the birth registration but not in the immunization, who could represent maybe a zero dose or a loss to follow up? Well, it's very simple now. I can just go to a data element that's in program two, program two being the, in this uh, scenario, the uh, immunization program, program one being the uh, birth registration. And I can say, is empty null, click update, and so now I see a list of those individuals who are in program one, birth registration, who are not have any data captured for program two, immunization. Okay? <laughs> Another feature that we have added to everyone's favorite maps app is the addition of vector and geojson layers in the maps app. Now, you have been able to add external layers to the Maps app for quite a long time now, but with this addition, you are able to add much more dynamic uh, and interactive uh, files being uh, vector or GeoJSON. This is important because we know that you're getting a lot of data from other sources, uh, and there are increasingly number of use cases that are dependent upon maps or, or, uh, or um, uh, positioning or uh, outreach programs. So, for example, some situations where this might be useful. Uh, if you have settlement extents, so say you have a map that represents settlement extents or maybe settlement uh, boundaries that's important for maybe outreach campaigns or door-to-door -door campaigns, uh, maybe that's provided by a third party, then you can now import that into DHIS2 and represent those onto a standard DHIS2 map. Um, we also have things like uh, if you have maps that represent spray operation areas, if you're doing indoor residual spraying, or if you're doing outreach sites, um, focal areas for case disease detection, or even just if you're monitoring infrastructure, water wells, something like that. Um, all of that is now could be imported in. So I'm going to go over to the Maps app. All right, and then I'm going to add a layer, and here I'm just going to add Sierra Leone's facility catchment areas. So there you go. So it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward, but you can see I can click on one of these and I can get my, some additional information about each one of these. These catchment areas, as people often wonder, DHIS2 does not have the ability to capture catchment areas. We, you have to use other sources to capture the catchment areas. But one of those sources is an organization called Crosscut, who we work very, very closely with. They have an application, um, uh, DHIS2 application, that makes it extremely easy for any country to draw catchment areas for anything they want, not just health facilities. It could be catchment areas for schools, could be catchment areas for uh, infrastructure, boreholes, um, outreach sites, anything like that, Crosscut can help you with. And again, they have an application that very seamlessly pushes it straight into DHIS2. So this is an example of catchment areas just for Sierra Leone as a vector file. All right. As David and Mike pointed out, we now support uh, multi-select option sets. And the question is, how are these represented in DHIS2? Well, the initial version that we are supporting in the 41 release is having a new expression in indicators and program indicators that allows you to be explicit about how you want to aggregate by your option sets. So that's a lot of DHIS2 lingo, um, but essentially we have contains and contains in, and if you're using these expressions, you can be saying, I want to see a program indicator that aggregates by these diseases that is maybe presented to the end user as a drop down as an option set, right? And, and uh, aggregate or count by, by that. So, this is the first step. We're hoping to add a much more functionality and flexibility for option sets in the future, but at least this will get you to be able to produce indicators and program indicators with multi-select option sets. A little bit of a, okay. Don't be shy. All right. 
<laughs> the, uh, the last one is we have a new uh, DHIS2 push analysis. And let me ask you all a quick question. How many of you have checked your DHIS2 dashboards this morning? Nobody? One, two, three. Okay. How many of you have checked your email this morning? Yeah, that's everybody. I mean, <laughs> maybe, maybe they haven't woken up yet. <laughs> um, we need to send data where people are spending their time, right? We can't appreciate, we, we know that making a DHIS2 dashboard, or just making a dashboard generally, is not enough. We have to make sure that we're sending the data to where people can access it. People forget their logins, people forget the URLs. Even though we've made it so easy to, and, uh, uh, and um, optimized to look at analytics on your phone, people still are struggling to do it. Everyone accesses their email. You can now have DHIS2 automatically send a dashboard to someone's email. Okay? And this actually was an old feature of DHIS2. It's called push analysis. But it did not support all of the new chart types that we've introduced over the years. So now we have an entirely new push analysis engine. And this engine will allow you to have any chart type that you want and push it to anyone's email that you want at any frequency that you want. Okay? So there are two options here that I want to be kind of uh, clear on. The first one is you can send a dashboard based upon how it appears to the user who created the push analysis job. So whoever configured this, as the dashboard appears to them, that's how the person receiving the dashboard in their email will see it. So you can imagine I am a national system administrator. I have access to the national malaria control dashboard. And I want everyone to see the high level key impact indicators for malaria at national level, right? So I configure push analysis. I set it so that the user sees what I see. And then when they receive email, they will open up the email and they'll see exactly how the dashboard appears to me. Okay? The other option is if you want the user to, who receives the dashboard to have the data that's displayed on the dashboard reflect that user's permissions within DHIS2. Okay? So imagine the scenario, I am again still the national uh, uh, DHIS2 system administrator, but I am making a district level dashboard. Right? And I want this to be sent out to all of the district health managers. Well, using the second option, I can make a national dashboard using relative org unit assignment on that dashboard. And then I can set this up. I can, it will send out the dashboard. Um, and the user receiving it will see the data that reflects their district. Right? Okay. One quick point on this is that second option it takes about three seconds per dashboard to be rendered and to be sent. So, just a fair warning that if you're going to start sending it out to 20,000 users, which you could do, it's going to take a couple of hours to run. All right? So, no JIRA tickets on that. We have warned you. <laughs> we are trying to optimize and speed it up, but in the, at least in this initial release, that is the, that's the burden. All right. So, I think with that, I'm done. I'll hand it off to Austin. Thanks, Scott. Oh, great, that worked. So, everybody's favorite topic, uh, I'm sure. Oh, uh, well, yeah, that's good. We've, we've heard this uh, referenced a number of times already today. I tried to count the number of features that we talked about today that relate to extensibility, and I stopped counting at 15. Um, there's, there were more than that, but I'll tell you a little bit about why this is so important, even if it's not the first thing that you see when you open up DHIS2. But when we talk about continuous release of all the applications that you just heard about, that's all built on the extensibility platform. When we talk about the push analysis uh, functionality, that's an extension to the core DHIS2 because it's running a separate service on the server side. Uh, when we talk about the, the way that the Android app is, is, is deployed, there's a lot of relation to extensibility there as well. When we talk about the plugins in the capture application, that's extensibility, um, and, and many, many more. As Kristen uh, presented this morning, we also are building a lot of 
extensions that are beyond those core applications ourselves as well in the different domains that we support, from climate to education to logistics to health um, and many more. And all of you are also building extensions and adapting DHS2 to your local context, your local use cases. And many of you are also sharing those extensions with other people. And that really is the power of this platform and this community to be able to share innovations and work together to solve really big challenging problems all over the world. So I want to talk about a few of the functionality uh, additions that we've made in version 41, specifically related to extensibility. Um, a lot of other work has gone on under the hood that I won't talk too much about today, uh, and we'll be seeing even more coming soon. But the first of those, Mike already mentioned, is the ability to support new extension points within DHIS2 where you can plug in functionality to the core DHIS2 uh, applications or features. So we talked about uh, plugins being added to the capture application. This means that previously, if you wanted to add that um, uh, growth chart uh, to the capture application, you would need to fork the capture application, basically build your own version of the whole thing just to add that one chart to the enrollment dashboard, for example. And we saw this quite a bit during COVID-19 when people would fork the capture or the tracker capture application to add a single button to generate a certificate or would uh, want to add a small bit of functionality somewhere. They then need to fork or copy the code for the capture app or the tracker capture app. And it requires a lot of work, it requires a lot of maintenance, and it's very hard then to keep up to date with the, the updates that are coming from the core team. So we are adding extension points in different places within DHIS2. We've had this for a long time with applications, and we've had this for a long time with plugins on the dashboard. But we're adding it now to more places where you can build just a small piece of functionality and then plug that into the places where it makes sense. Uh, so that's what we've added to the capture application in two different locations um, for uh, data entry in uh, event capture as well as in the enrollment dashboard, which is the, um, uh, the growth chart plugin that uh, Mike demonstrated earlier. There are also a number of API enhancements that we've added in version 41 to support extensibility. Uh, I won't spend too much time on these because it's not as visually appealing as some of the other features that you've seen today. Uh, but one of those is to be able to perform partial updates and rolling updates to keys within the data store. So the data store is a way that extensions can save or persist data, uh, and it's a very flexible system that lets them uh, have, have basically persistence of um, configuration or of uh, their own mechanism for saving and re reloading different types of visualizations, many different things. But for a long time, it's been difficult to update that uh, as that, that database, that mini database within the data store grows, it's been difficult to update that, um, uh, those keys or the, that data without downloading all of it to the local browser and then made, making some edits and updating the entire version again. That can be challenging when you have multiple users running at the same time. It can be challenging for the bandwidth that's used in the network. And so this extension has allowed us to, uh, or allows users of the data store to be able to make partial updates uh, to the, the data that they're storing there in the data store. And rolling appends is very uh, interesting as well. So you can add something to a list and make sure that that list has a maximum size. So you can say, I want to add a new item to this list, but I want to, if there are more than three items after this is added, I want to get rid of the oldest ones. So you can do a rolling append to a list, which is a very powerful feature as well. The second feature here, which if you've run into it, you know that this is a big challenge. If you've never run into this, you probably don't, uh, will never need to use it. But it is uh, something that was actually very highly requested in the, um, uh, when we asked for ideas from the community for the roadmap. Uh, and we're excited to be able to introduce this already in version 41, even though it was just uh, requested a few months ago. And this is to be able to shorten que uh, queries that might be very, very long, too long for the browser, too long for the network switches between the browser and the server, uh, that can cause problems that are very hard to work around for users and can be frustrating. So now you can uh, basically shorten those queries using a first-class feature of DHS2 called query aliases, 
uh, and then you can um, access that data using a much, basically a, a shortened URL, a shortened link. And then the final one, which is coming in version 41.1, uh, is the ability to extend uh, API routes to support other HTTP verbs like post and delete, uh, which are very useful when you're talking to an external service. And for those of you who don't remember, the, the routes API is a powerful functionality to basically use DHIS2 as a proxy to other backend services. And so DHIS2 provides the authentication and the authorization for certain users to be able to use that service and hides the credentials for that service on the back end. So you don't need to expose those to the, the browser, which is a very important security feature for different types of extensions. And then the last piece, which is expen uh, experimental in version 41, and more you'll see a lot more of this coming soon and probably rolling out as a, the default behavior within all the applications within DHIS2, is the ability to serve different applications using a global app shell, which allows us to have a consistent look and feel and a consistent uh, experience for users of DHIS2 no matter which application they're using, whether that's a core application or whether that's something that uh, is used by the, or, or is developed by the community. Um, this will also allow you to customize this uh, global shell for your instance so that you can introduce functionality to your users that is available to them no matter which application they're using. And you don't need to go and, and edit all of those different applications or ask the developers of those applications to edit them for you. Just to, just to mention that this is opt-in and, and experimental in version 41, so if you don't, uh, if you don't use it, you won't see it. Um, and it's something that we'll be adding on to in the future, so you'll see more of this coming soon but probably won't notice this uh, out of the box. Okay, so now I wanna talk about the app competition, which we've had every year for the, for the last several years now, five years maybe. Um, and uh, this year we're gonna be doing it a little bit differently. So I'm gonna actually be introducing the three finalists that we have for the app competition right now, today. Uh, and then we'll have voting open throughout the conference. So this is what Max mentioned as well this morning, that uh, we'll have voting open on the community of practice throughout this week. We will close that voting at noon on Thursday, and then we will announce the winner at the award ceremony Thursday afternoon. Um, so I'll be looking forward to, to sharing the, the presentation of these applications from each of the finalists. And this is a really exemplifying what it means to be an extensible platform, to have people build on top of it and share those extensions with the community and to be able to use, for all of you to be able to use things that other people have built to adapt them and to build on top of them to really grow the, the entire ecosystem of innovations and of uh, functionality that is available to all of the users of DHIS2. So I have three finalists this year. Um, the first is an application called uh, Metadata Assignments. Um, sorry, Grant, I think I changed the order here, uh, or it's a different uh, version, but hopefully this will work. We're gonna show you a video from each of these finalists to uh, introduce their application. Um, so those three finalists are Metadata Assignments, built by the University of Dar es Salaam, FormForge, built by FHI 360, and Metadata Sync, built by ICT. So let's give a round of applause for all three. And we had, a, we had a large number of applicants and we were really uh, impressed with the quality. It was a difficult choice as it always is uh, and gets harder every year to choose these finalists. But we're really excited to have you, you see the videos that they put together uh, to introduce their applications and uh, looking forward to seeing more applicants next year. So with that, I think we'll turn it over to Grant who will play us the videos from these three finalists. Hi everyone, welcome to DHS2 Metadata Assignment Hub, a powerful tool designed to streamline the process of managing metadata within the DHS2 platform. Are you bogged down by spending hours assigning organization units, datasets, and programs in the DHS2? Well, this repetitive task can be a major drain on your administrative workload. Well, fret no more. The DHS2 Metadata Assignment Hub is here to revolutionize your workflow. The app's core functionality revolves around bulk assignment. 
This means you can say goodbye to tedious process of assigning the same metadata element to countless entries one by one. With the DHS2 metadata assignment app, you can efficiently assign metadata in bulk, significantly reducing your administrative burden and freeing up your valuable time. But that's not all. The benefits of this app extends beyond just saving you time. It also promotes a decentralized approach to metadata management. This means that national administrators won't be solely responsible for managing all metadata assignments. The app empowers low-level users, such as those at the district or the regional level, to manage metadata assignments within their specific areas of responsibility. This approach offers a win-win situation. National teams are relieved of a significant workload, allowing them to focus on other crucial tasks. At the same time, local users gain more ownership of their data and have the power to manage it more effectively. Security is paramount and the DHS2 metadata assignment app understands this concern. You might be wondering how to ensure non-super users users can manage their assigned metadata without accidentally impacting the entire system configuration. The app addresses this concern by providing a secure interface specifically designed for these users. This interface offers the, all the functionalities they need to manage their assigned metadata without risking of making unintended changes to the overall system configuration. Let's start by exploring the key features of the assignment app and how it can simplify your workflow. When you open the assignment app from DHS2 menu, you'll be greeted with the form assignment table. This table displays organization units and collection forms available in your instance with green table cells indicating datasets or programs that have already been assigned to an organization unit. To assign or unassign an organization unit to or from a dataset or program, simply search for the organization unit you want to assign the dataset or program to, click on the table cell to assign or unassign a dataset or program. When assigning, the cell color will transition from its original state to yellow, then to green. When unassigning, the cell color will change from green to yellow and finally back to its original color. In addition to assigning or unassigning organization units to datasets or programs, you can also click on the organization unit hierarchy icon to choose a specific organization unit for assignment. Search for a specific collection form and assign it to an organization unit accordingly. You can also search for a specific collection form that you want to assign to an organization unit. Then you can click on a table cell to assign or unassign the dataset or program to the organization unit accordingly. As you can see, the assignment app makes it easy to manage assignments with its intuitive interface and straightforward process. With these capabilities, the assignment app offers flexibility and efficiency in managing assignments within your DHS2 instance. I hope you found this video very informative and now you can leverage this tool to streamline your assignment processes effectively. If you have any questions or need further assistance, please don't hesitate to reach out. Until next time, goodbye. So again, that was a metadata assignment from University of Dar es Salaam. And next up, I believe we have FormForge. We will see which one comes up next. We have... In the global health sector, data serves as the cornerstone of progress. 
yet managing this data efficiently remains a formidable challenge. Introducing FormForge, an innovative solution designed by FHI 360 to transform the way custom forms are built and maintained within DHIS2. Creating and updating custom forms for aggregate data collection in DHIS2 is complicated and time-consuming. As more metadata categories and category combinations are added, the work to create, maintain, and test forms grows, increasing the labor cost for teams supporting DHIS2-based custom forms. For large data sets, routine updates to a form can take days or weeks. Even with careful testing, the process remains error-prone. WormForge was designed to overcome these challenges with a point-and-click, no-code interface that is configured to generate a form. FormForge users start by creating a form project and associating it with a data set. Side navigation can be added based on the logical divisions of the data set. Data elements can then be chosen from the data set. For each data element, up to six levels of disaggregation can be selected based on the category combinations defined for that data element. Categories can be included or excluded as needed from the disaggregation. Exclusion rules can be defined to exclude unneeded categories from use with a data element, and the same rule can be reused with any data element sharing the same category combination. For instance, males can be excluded from any pregnancy-related data element. Custom labels can be defined for data elements or disaggregation. For example, to shorten default labels associated with the data element. When the form project is fully configured, or at any time during configuration, FormForge can generate the custom form for the data set with the click of a button. When you open the data set in DHIS2, you will find the deployed project form as a custom form for that data set. You will find the form components, navigations, exclusions, and the labels already configured in the project. If changes are needed to the deployed form, the user can make the changes and redeploy. Designing, developing, and deploying custom forms for DHIS2 is a time-consuming process. Building out custom templates, entering data fields into the form builder, and reviewing and correcting any errors are essential, time-consuming tasks that often run up against deadlines. The process can be prone to errors. It can be difficult to catch mistakes in the code of custom templates, and often the errors go unnoticed. Furthermore, the skills involved include knowing HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, skills that are often in short supply. FormForge offers a solution to custom form design. It has a user-friendly interface for creating custom forms that are accessible without any specialized knowledge. It seamlessly integrates with DHIS2 to import disaggregated data elements, supporting form versioning for better management and tracking. Overall, it reduces production time for form creation and testing, resulting in quicker rollouts of data collection forms.
And as a final finalist, we have Metadata Sync from ICT. And then I will open the voting just after this so that you can have the rest of the week to vote and you can see these videos as well online. DHIS2 is used by hundreds of public administrations and organizations worldwide to collect data and inform national and global decisions on public health. However, each instance of DHIS2 is a self-contained environment and sharing data and metadata across multiple implementations can be a challenging and labor-intensive process. Metadata Sync is the solution. The Metadata Sync app is designed to simplify and automate the process of synchronizing and sending data and metadata between any number of DHIS2 implementations, however different they might be. Metadata Sync can compare two or more DHIS2 instances, map their metadata and save the mapping, send data from one instance to another, making all necessary transformations automatically on the fly, keep selected metadata synchronized between instances. Metadata Sync gives you full control. You can decide if you want to send all available data or just a few parts of it. You can send data as it is, or aggregate it in some way. And what's more, data and metadata synchronizations can be fully automated. You can schedule them to run without any manual work. Save time and energy to focus on what matters, and let Metadata Sync do the heavy lifting. Hello, I am Nacho Foce, Director of ICT, and I'm going to quickly highlight some of my favorite features from our Metadata Sync. First of all, the interface of Metadata Sync. You can do everything, and I mean everything, from the graphical interface, which is user-friendly and intuitive. I'm going to just quickly show you some screens, but I invite you to watch our tutorial so you can see how easy it is to use. When syncing metadata and data between the HS2 instances, very often they are not completely aligned, and you need to adjust a UID here, a code there. All that is solving Metadata Sync by its graphical mapping that you can see here. After creating an instance, you click on metadata mapping and you can map everything, all the metadata, including the organization units that you have. So the uh, mapping is so easy as I'm what I'm going to show you. So you can just decide a certain element, you click on auto map and the auto map feature will do the work for you. It will try to find a UAD, a code or doing do a best effort strategy with a name and provide you with a, a possible match that uh, it won't only be the, the element in itself, but any dependency like the related metadata mapping. In, key, in this case, it also found a perfect match for all the category options that were associated to the category combination of that data element. Once you have uh, mapped your metadata, then you can go and execute your synchronization that can be aggregated data, individual data, or metadata. All of those can be a one-off, that's the manual sync, or it can be a rule that you might want to execute later in the future, uh, or even a schedule, you can schedule a rule. Creating a rule is not so difficult, it's just following these steps. You, you will be selecting metadata, you will be selecting the dependencies of that metadata in case that you want to exclude some, and then you can select multiple destination instances at that time if you want, schedule it, and you are done, basically. Uh, one of the beauties of Metadata Sync is also that it's keeping a history of everything. At any point, you can check what was the result of a synchronization, who executed it, and what was the status. So you can investigate later what happened in your synchronizations and why you have the metadata that you have. Another very powerful uh, feature of Metadata Sync is the metadata distribution. You can create metadata packages and uh, by simply creating a module, which is a pointer to your metadata, then clicking on create a package from that module, and that will give it a version. And uh, your DHS2 will become a distribution system of packages. So that means that anybody with another metadata sync can point to you, I can see your packages and decide to install them. Then it's the super easy, if you prefer, to just publish the package to a GitHub repository which will become the uh, distribution system. 
we really hope this app is useful for you, at least as it is for us. And we are looking forward uh, to your feedback and your vote. Thanks so much from me and from the ICT team. So luckily it's not my job to pick the winner, it's all of your job to pick the winner. So the voting will be open in just a moment. Actually, I will do it just now. And you can go ahead and vote on the community of practice. Uh, Gassim will also be uh, sharing a post in the announcements category, but the voting itself is in the development category. You can find it on there, you can find links to all the videos, learn more about these applications, uh, add comments and communicate with the developers, uh, and really looking forward to seeing who you select as the winner for this year's app competition. And with that, I think we are wrapped up for this session and we'll turn it over to the, the official uh, opening, I believe. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Austin. Big hand to the, all the presenters.